Two guys in rowback. Me and JD Piquel. You heard you know JD. He's the host of the hard count here at On Three. I hope you're watching that every Tuesday and Thursday live. You're subscribed to the On Three YouTube channel, obviously. If you're not, what are you doing? Because you get this guy in your feed all the time. And yes, I said two guys wearing rowback, the performance hoodie, the greatest garment known to man. Roback.com, R-H-O-B-A-C-K.com. The promo code is STAPLES. You get 20% off your first order. Performance hoodies, Q-zips, polos. The Performance Crew, I saw JD mm. wearing one of those yesterday, mm. fills it out mm. very nicely. <laughs> also here, there might be some fleece Ooh. coming from Roback okay. as winter approaches. So yeah, go load up at Roback.com, R-H-O-B-A-C-K.com. Staples is your promo code. 20% off your first order. You will be as luxurious as we are. Mm. And that's a good place to be. All right, JD, we got to talk. We're going to have a conference check-in. We're, we're whipping around the Power Five Love it. before the Power Five ceases to exist in about two weeks. Uh, this is going to be a crazy stretch run. So much going on. But let's start in the SEC where there are two jobs open now, which the, the Mississippi State, when we knew was coming... The Texas A&M one, I think if you thought it through, you knew it was going to happen. But it was still one of those where you see the Jimbo Fisher fired and your mind does the tally of the $76 million buyout. And you're like, how? <laughs> but what do you think happens at Texas A&M? Who, who, who are you rooting for to get that job? Who would you like to see as, as the head Aggie? You know, I think there's so many names that get thrown around with – you know, Dan Lanning and Lane Kiffin. And to me, when I think about what A&M needs, it feels like they need more of a substance and structural hire. Not that both those guys couldn't work. It just feels like you kind of get back on the hype train, high expectations. See, I, th I don't think Lanning's a hype hire. I just don't think Lanning's going to leave. I think, For sure, no. I think because, it, because Oregon is now a Big Ten job, mm -hmm. and they have resources, and they have proof of concept where they played for the national title twice in 13 years. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think that's a bet. I don't think A and M's a better job than Oregon. No, hundred percent, hundred percent. And I mean, speaking of substance, I mean rooted in substance, Dan yeah. Lanning. So I mean, there's they're definitely that box is checked. But I'm with you. I think that Dan Lanning would be tough to go away from Oregon. I think Lane Kiffin, you're kind of getting back on the on the hype train of high expectations. I like Mike Elko. I think he's structure. I think he's done more with less. And I think he is a differentiator in the sense that he's been at A and M. Yeah. Andy, you know this like. It's a different it's a different thing you're signing up for if mm -hmm. you go be a part of what they're doing in Bryan College Station. So I think the fact there wouldn't be this big acclamation of getting Texas A&M, yeah, I like it. He, he knows it. And that's the thing. Like Texas A&M can be a shock to the system mm -hmm. if you don't know it, if you've never worked there before, if you've never recruited in Texas before. Elko's done all that stuff. And But you're right. He's done the less with more. And he's been – I think that's interesting about Elko. I hadn't thought about it this way. But, you know, Elko came up with Dave Clawson. Bowling Green, Wake Forest. But then he goes to Notre Dame. He goes to Texas A&M. So he's been at the places where the expectations are massive and the resources are massive. Mm -hmm. So you've seen him be successful in a, at, you know, in a different job at that type of place. But then you've seen him do less with more. Because the question I always have when, when you've got someone who can do less with more, sometimes the guy who can do less with more can't do more with more. Yep. yep. I think you know, Dan Mullen's an, a, an example of that, where he was great at Mississippi State. He was good at Florida until it became clear that he wasn't capable of beating Alabama and Georgia for recruits regularly, which is a requirement if you would like to play for national titles. And so it's different. Those are different jobs. Duke's a different job than Texas A&M. So the question is, can you do more with more? I'll give you another example from Florida, though. Urban Meyer did less with more at Utah mm. and then absolutely did more with more at Florida and at Ohio State. So that... That's one of those that we don't know until we see that person in the job. But I agree with you on Elko. I feel like he's a good fit there. And what we've seen him do at Duke, where their athletic profile is so much better than it was before he got there. And that's a hard place to build a team of really good athletes. 100%. I mean, I'll, another guy that I'm curious to hear your thoughts on is, is Chris Kleiman. Because he kind of yeah. fits that same mold, but there's that bigger question mark of, Okay, well, can you actually do more with more? You think you can because, right. I mean, three stars at Kansas mm -hmm. State and what did it at the FCS level, but that is a, a very different beast going to the yeah. SEC, being in College Station. Is that a fit? That would be my number two if I'm AM. I am I do not know. If, see, I, if I'm going to go guy who's won everywhere, lower level, Leipold is the guy I would hmm. go with. Uh, and, and it's so funny that 
they're two these two great coaches both working in the state of Kansas right now with Kleiman and Leipold. Uh, but Leipold would be my guy if I wanted to do it that way. Kleiman, it definitely feels like Kansas State and, and North Dakota State are fairly similar jobs, even though North Dakota State's expectations within the FCS are so much higher. Mm-hmm. But they're very developmental jobs. You got the other thing about Kleiman, and I don't think people think about this as much as they should. When you've got a quarterback, you better not leave unless it's perfect. Because hmm. Kleiman's got Avery Johnson right now at Kansas State. Yeah. And I think Avery Johnson could be a superstar. And so you got to be really careful leaving that behind. And obviously, if A&M is going to dump, you know, dump a bunch of money in your lap, you're probably going to think about that. Mm-hmm. But that's one thing. If I'm Chris Kleiman, I'm very selective because I've got my quarterback of the future. And I, I don't know if that's what I want to do. But that's another good one, substance over, over flash. Mm. I do think... This is why I mentioned Sharon Moore for this job. And I, I, I do think if Harbaugh leaves, Sharon Moore would obviously be the favorite at Michigan. But what if Harbaugh stays Yeah, and decides he wants to be there for a while? Like, Sharon Moore is ready to be a head coach right now. And being a good offensive line developer travels. Like, I don't care that he's not worked in, in the South necessarily. He, he played at Oklahoma. Yeah. Like, he understands how all this stuff works. Like, I, I want someone who can develop people on the lines of scrimmage. Whether that's D-line, oh, I don't care. I want someone who understands that. And Sharon Moore absolutely understands that. So I would I would do my homework if I'm Ross Bjork on him and at least inquire. Because the one thing A&M does need to think about is they don't need to get roped into a, a contract where they are tied to this and have to pay this massive bill. Like The idea of hiring a coordinator is not the worst thing in the world where you may not have to lock yourself into this massive contract. I mean, look, a coordinator of the level of Sharon Moore is going still to command a decent buyout. For sure. But not like Jimbo Fisher, not like a sitting head coach right now would. And before you say, well, why would you hire a coordinator? Kirby Smart was a coordinator when he got hired. Dabo Sweeney was a receivers coach when he got hired. Ryan Day was a coordinator when he got hired. Guess what? They're pretty good. Lincoln Riley was a coordinator when he became a head coach. Yep. It's It's not... It's probably about the same percentage wise. And I think like the happiness around College Station with hiring a coordinator, there would be that immediate like, ah, really? But I think like what you said is on the money, the context around where that coordinator's from. Like Sharon Moore could go be a head coach at a lot of Power Five schools it, tomorrow. If, if you're a, a good offensive line guy, and Alex Atkins at Florida State yes, is another yep, another yeah, example yeah. of this. I don't know that Alex definitely would would qualify for the A and M job, but I think he's probably getting a head coaching job after this season. Like. If you are a good developer of offensive linemen, it does not matter where you're from. It does not matter where you've recruited. You're good at offensive line. You'll figure it out. Yeah, 100%. 100%. I mean, in, in the same vein, like from that coordinator hiring train of thought, there would be the immediate feel of like, really, because we can take a big swing for Texas saying that mm-hmm. we, we can go and throw money at the big names we talked about already in this segment in, in Lane Kiffin and Dan Lanning. Um, but if you hire a coordinator from the right spot, I mean, you could strike gold, like you said, with Absolutely. a guy like Kirby Smart or Abbas Sweeney. All right. Mississippi State open now, too. This is one where it feels like they've got some good group of five head coach options, which it's been hard lately to jump from the group of five to an SEC job to a Big Ten job because they tend to go for coordinators. But there's, there's a couple like Manny Diaz, who's been their D.C. a couple times. Mm. He's the D.C. at Penn State. He's one I'd look at. Glenn Schumann, in the D.C. at Georgia. If you're looking for the, that next Dan Lanning, that's one I'd look at. But I think, J.D., there's, there's a few good group of five head coaches. John Summerall at Troy, uh, Rhett Lashley at SMU. Like Those are guys you should seriously consider. I like Jamie Chadwell. I didn't uh, even think about Manny one. Diaz. Yeah. Jamie Chadwell makes a lot of sense to me. And just from a sheer phil- uh, philosophical mm-hmm. perspective, rather, it feels like you're in the SEC – you're playing the Georgias up front. You're playing the Bamas up front, the LSU historically. like It feels like you need to kind of zig where other people are zagging. Yep. That spread option offense, yep. I think that could be the answer for that. I like that from a schematic standpoint because you become a team that becomes hard to prepare for because they, they use triple option concepts, but they're spread out and they, they attack vertically. It's actually like you go back to Tom Osborne in the mid-90s mm. where the triple option was Nebraska's play action, basically. <laughs> That's what Liberty's doing right now. Yeah. Like and and now would you leave Liberty after year? I don't know. And Liberty's an interesting one because they can pay way more than most schools at that level can pay. So potentially, you know, they they could offer him a, a sweetheart offer 
that makes it hard. But good SEC jobs don't open very often. Right, yeah. But, I mean, going back to the, the personnel that they maybe don't have in-house at Mississippi State, yeah. that could kind of be your – I don't know what the right word would be, kind of your bridge, if you will, mm-hmm. to being able to beat those teams. I mean, and, and historically, that's what they tried to do with Mike Leach when he was exactly. there. I mean, rest in peace, Mike Leach. But when they went with the air raid, that mm-hmm. was kind of their answer. And what they were doing defensively was Zach Arnett. That three three five is essentially like playing yeah. the triple option, except on the other side of the ball. Yeah. So I, I think I think you're onto something there. We'll see. We'll get to check the tape and Let find out in a the, few few weeks. That's few right. <laughs> Let us move to the ACC, where Florida State appears headed to an undefeated season. Mm-hmm. I, I think they're in good shape here. I think they're going to beat Florida. They should be able to beat Louisville. We'll see. I, Louisville's going to be an interesting one because they, they're very up and down despite being 9-1. and one. But, you know, what do you think happens this week, Louisville-Miami? Yeah. I'll, it's, cl- it's close. Right? We're Spreads doing, tight. Thinking about <laughs> yeah. it really, really hard, especially with how hard Miami pushed Florida State the week before. Yeah. There's kind of this thought of, well, how do you circle the wagons and did you empty the tank against your rival? Um, but Louisville didn't look that impressive against Virginia. Now, was that, you know, some weeknight magic that uh, Virginia's yeah. getting Thursday together? Night's you know, a strange you time. Can never yeah. tell. Uh, I think to me, it does come down to Jamari Thrash and his effectiveness for Louisville. I mean, when he's on and when they're feeding him accordingly, like, one of the most explosive players in the country. Yeah. And so that kind of be the differentiator. He could be their Marvin Harrison Jr. against Penn State in that game. We've also seen Miami, now not not in the Mario Cristobal era, but we have seen Miami defensively get just shredded in the run game. Like, could Jawar Jordan have a big game? Mm-hmm. And, and Josh Newberg brought up an, an interesting point on the pick show. Uh, Josh, who's covered Florida State for years and years, said, you know, it, it tends to be when Miami loses to Florida State that it costs them a couple more games down the line. Hmm. They, they kind of just can't mentally recover and they did put a lot of eggs in that basket like they played great against florida state awesome. compared to how they've been playing so we'll, we'll see but that'll be that'll be an interesting one the acc needs florida state to be undefeated yeah like that that's how they get the playoff yeah and then you know we'll, we'll see what happens clemson upswing did tyler from spartanburg save clemson season <laughs> It feels like he definitely did his part. Like in, in terms of what you had to do as a fan calling in, yeah. uh, he took a lot of backlash for it now. I don't know if he was trending on Twitter. Do he's you probably he's close. A plant? I don't, I don't. I don't buy he's a yeah. plant. I mean, I, I get why people would think that because he got off a full sonnet when he was doing the <laughs> call-in show. <laughs> and I was just like, if I'm Dabo, I'm like, are you not going to cut this guy off? <laughs> um, I don't think he's a plant, but I think he will uh, – he will be remembered forever, depending on how Clemson finishes this season and goes forward next season. All right, give him a game ball, if nothing else, from the Notre Dame. Give game. him a T-shirt. Give him a nice little <laughs> windbreaker. I would see those on the side. Those are nice. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let us move to the Big 12. Fascinating situation in Ames. Mm. If Texas goes up there and loses, we're not even going to bother trying to figure out the, the tiebreakers because it's a fool's errand. Yes. But Jonathan Brooks tears his ACL. Texas has Quinn Ewers back, but obviously loses their best running back. C.J. Baxter will have to pick up a slack. Do you think Iowa State can pull this off? I think they can, just for the sheer fact that it's Ames. Yeah. And it's just one of those things where you're trying to break the game down, and we're looking at matchups and looking at scheme, and you're just like, well, this is in Ames, Iowa, so it may not matter at Haycock's all. There might be something that happens. Like, that defense will have a, a plan without for question. Quinn Ewers. Without question. Now, I, I still think there's a, there's a possibility – that the JT Sanders, Xavier Worthy, Jordan Whittington, AD Mitchell, like it's just too much. It's stupid, yeah. But if they make some mistakes and that crowd stays in it, because I've I've been there. I've I was on the field when they stormed it after Oklahoma State in 2011. That's awesome. And I mean that that crowd was hyped. The entire it's cold. Sure. It's dark. Like I don't know. It's. It feels like they, it's, they call it Hilton magic in their basketball arena. Hmm. I don't know if there's Jack Trice magic, but well, I guess we'll find we'll out on find Saturday. We'll find out. And it feels like, too, for Texas, like the last couple of weeks, I believe with their last four wins, they've mm-hmm. won three of them by one score. And some yeah. of that you say, well, hey, Quinn Ewers wasn't playing. Totally fair. But, like, we're messing around with TCU. I'm, I'm, I'm watching that game before flipping it over to the other night game because it's actually going to be interesting at the oh, finish. Yeah. Like, are they treading water? Was it Quinn Ewers was rusty? Like, yeah, where, where like, are we at? It feels like Sark kind of just pulled back on the reins a little bit and was like, eh, you're, we're good. We're hoping. We're hoping they for were 20, things at Texas. They were 26 to 6, though. Yeah. And, like, I keep waiting for Texas to just blow, blow somebody out. Mm-hmm. And they did that against Kansas. 
But they didn't against Kansas State. Obviously, they were the backup quarterback, but they didn't against TCU. Like, and against Houston, and, yeah. and same situation, kind of got got back into Just the game with Quinn Ewers getting hurt. Yeah, got to see it. Pac-12 is really interesting this week. Yeah, my goodness, there's so many. Like, even that Friday night game with Colorado, Washington State, like losers of six in a row versus losers of five of six. Coach Prime trying to grab a win. Jake Dickert, you know, what goes from being one of the hottest coaches in the country to now he can't figure out. Like they keep losing. They've lost the last two games by three. Mm-hmm. One was 10-7 and one was 42-39. Like, none of that makes sense. You think Coach Prime gets another win this season? I don't. I oh, don't, think- just just because of the sheer fact of And we, we had this thought, too, even during the season, like, hey, this team, they're hot, they're 3-0, and vibes are high, but it's also a completely new roster. What happens when they start losing? Mm-hmm. And I don't know that it's a thing where one loss has led to the next, but it's starting to feel like once that thing gets moving in a certain direction – with a bunch of guys that didn't know each other before the season, you just you wonder where they're competitively at. And so Washington State, I mean, kind of in that same situation, if I'm coming down to picking this one, I just think the line of scrimmage for, for Washington yeah. State is probably better than what Colorado has, which isn't saying a ton, but I think that's the difference. So Washington and Oregon State, another very interesting game. Big one at Reeser. But I want to go a little somewhere else in the conference. Not a game necessarily. UCLA... Getting the vibes that Chip Kelly may be in trouble there. And you think about it, and you're like, okay, well, like, but they kept extending him. Mm-hmm. But the idea that they're going into the Big Ten feels like if you're going to press a reset button, maybe this is the time you press it. Yeah, and when, it's funny because, like you said, like there's nothing from the outside looking into the house – noticeably wrong like you look at the record like hey they're six they're six and four the quarterback plays the Arizona State result was one of the most shocking ones this season sure you see the score and you're like huh sure definitely and you know Chip Kelly a guy who specializes in offense for that to be the result but no when when I look at UCLA um, I think like you said it's it's 100% true moving into a conference where one you're gonna have to be better than the line of scrimmage Mm -hmm. and UCLA has some ground to make up really good pass rushers there but good pass line is not what they thought it was going to be this year and you got to acquire talent and, yeah. and, Chip, and Chip Kelly, for all the things that he's phenomenal at, recruiting isn't necessarily no. like right in his wheelhouse. Like if they had – like those Jim Mora-era rosters yeah. coached a little bit differently, mm-hmm. like that's a team that can compete in the Big Ten. Absolutely. Josh Rosen when he was – wrong, Jaleel Wadud playing safe. Oh, they, uh, they had some guys. Oh, yeah. Anthony I mean, Barr. Yeah. They had Miles some guys. Jack. Like, they, yeah, that, they had that's some, a throwback. They, 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 they had Jack. some dudes. Yep. On those rosters, yeah, and he would like Jalen Phillips when when he signed there was a mm-hmm. massive recruit. Like they just have not done that under Chip Kelly, but you knew that. Mm-hmm. Like Chip Kelly had a choice between the UCLA and the Florida jobs, and I think wisely took UCLA because he knew he was not going to be expected to bring in the five star talent. But that was before the conference move. Like if you got to play Ohio State and Michigan and Penn State, and oh by the way, still have to play Washington and USC, and Oregon, like you better have some dudes on your team. Especially in a state that's so talent-rich yeah. in California. I mean, the Trinity League's right there. I'm not saying it's Florida or Texas, but by nature of how much talent you have access to, it's like, yeah. hey. They're the they, most populated state in the country. You don't got to get on the jet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you exactly. can you can get in the car, go down 55 South, and be in good shape to yeah. go find some good talent. Yeah, so I that's going to be a fascinating one to watch. That game with USC will be interesting because – Look, USC's trending in the wrong direction as well, but they're going to hire a new defensive coordinator. We'll see if Lincoln Riley can get things going on the recruiting trail. But the Pac-12 in general is, in its final three weeks, nothing but storylines. So awesome. It's crazy. So awesome. Like like throwing a party in the house before you sell it, that's what they're doing <laughs> yeah. this year. It's the, the way par- it feels. The party may be in Corvallis this week. Who knows? <laughs> yes. We'll see. That They're actually, Oregon State's favored in that game. At this, as, as we're recording this, they're favored. That may flip again, but just wild. All right, let's go to the Big Ten. Love it. Where if we're talking crazy, interesting, there's a court hearing yep. that will determine who will coach on the sidelines against Maryland. Will it be Sharon Moore or will it be Jim Harbaugh? Who you got? Let me, let me, do, you, do you know this uh, Timothy Connors? Do you know, do you know his history? Do, what's, do you, what's the line? Is there is, exactly. is there any betting odds on, on Harbaugh being well, on the sideline? What's interesting is so Connors was assigned the case originally, and then there was another judge that that picked it up, and that judge had presided over the Connor Stallions versus the HOA wow case wow. <laughs> but then she wasn't. Going to all Connors took it back, so it's. I, I love this that everybody's like, Well, 
what, what cases is he trying? <laughs> who does it? How does he trend? Who does he lean to? It's like an episode of Suits, is what it feels like. It's the best episode of Suits, yeah. JD. I'm glad you said that. I've yeah. been I've been working my way back through the seasons. Yeah, so. I haven't finished it yet. I haven't finished it yet. So I'm I'm. I watched it when six. it came out originally. I was a okay. big US, USA Network Blue Skies guy. Like, yep. can't wait until next summer when everybody discovers Royal Pains. Yeah, or uh, Psych, or or uh, Monk. Well, Psych's been out there. Like, yeah, I don't know. The people didn't pick up on Psych, but I'm telling you, they're gonna love Royal Pains. But yeah. Yes, this is the best episode of Suits. Like, this would have been an entire season-long arc of Suits. For sure. Like, Lewis Litt and Jim Harbaugh would have gotten along famously. Like that? <laughs> they, like, Lewis Litt and, and Harvey would have had to form a grudging alliance mm -hmm. because Harvey would need Lewis to communicate with Jim Harbaugh. And Mike Ross would have probably had a heart for Connor Stallions. Oh, he Mike Ross and Connor would Stallions just would have been peas been in a awesome. Pod. Would have been yes. awesome. Yeah, that's been your Suits review. There we go. If you haven't been <laughs> re-watching Suits on Netflix, you don't know what you're missing. There we go. But I don't think it matters who coaches Michigan in this game. I think they're going to beat the doors off of, of Maryland. But this has been a weird spot in past years for Ohio. I, I do find it interesting that the league decided to put Michigan in this spot instead of Ohio State with the at Maryland look ahead game yeah. going into that game. Just sprinkled it right yeah. in there. And because Ohio State, like you said, last year they, they were in College Park and, 2018 it, and it came was down to the wild. very end. And yeah. then, I mean, Michigan in this same spot a season ago against Illinois, mm -hmm. they kind of struggled. Now, Illinois was a bit very better good team and matched year, yeah. up much better than Maryland. But yeah. no, I think 100%. I mean, if Maryland. Maybe they wake up that day, dangerous man with nothing to lose. You, you, know, you, you never know. So I still think Michigan rolls, though, to be clear. You think Iowa's going to win the West? I feel like they've, they've like reasserted right? their dominance in it the West. It feels like it. It's one of those things where it's like, what is going on over there? It's kind of like the Pac-12, like the last year of that side of the conference, and they're just doing backflips and somersaults and not scoring touchdowns and hitting unders. Yeah. Like it's it's a total inverse of what you see in in the Pac-12 with a ton of with a ton of points, and it's awesome. I love it. I just feel like Iowa and Minnesota are sitting there going, we we gotta we gotta make this count, mm -hmm. and Illinois as well. We gotta make this count because next year <laughs> Oregon's coming in, USC's coming in, like. Yeah. We're getting pushed down the stack. Feels like Nebraska, if you had been able to somehow, some way, get Matt Rule a year earlier. Oh, yeah. And you build for that second year. Like, I think Nebraska's going to be fine. They do need to win this week. Yep. Like, they need to beat Wisconsin, which is not having a great couple weeks. Because Nebraska needs to get bowl eligible. Yep. And I'm not sure I like them to get bowl eligible against Iowa. No. Even though they won with an interim staff last year against the Hawkeyes. Like, I, I, they need to win this week and, and get that si number six. Yeah, without question. I mean, and if you can do that in your first year for Matt Rule, like – Historically, it's his first huge. year has been awful. Right. And because he's taken over such rebuilds at Temple and at yeah. Baylor, and those programs were in very different spots. And so if you're Nebraska and you get bowl eligible, I think you feel very validated of the last couple of years with preseason hype around the Scott Frost era. Like, hey, we, we, we got the guys. We just needed the right driver of this whole thing. J.D., appreciate it. Tons of storylines everywhere around the country. We have just taken you from coast to coast in like 25 minutes. Yep. And walked through suits. Watch their suits. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Again, I, I really do think if you want to reboot the show, capitalize on the popularity from the Netflix bump that it's gotten. Mm. You reboot the show with a season where they defend Michigan in the sign stealing case. I don't know that you can get Meghan Markle now. She's royalty. She's probably been Tough pretty get. expensive. So, Tough get. So Rachel Zane probably not back. But everybody else? Like the guy who played Lewis had a great bit part on Billions, but Billions is done. Mm. It's time to it's time to bring those people home. You need A and M or Jimbo Fisher to fit the bill to get a reboot going, and then we can get Meghan Markle oh, in too. Do you think? Well, is Jimbo Fisher funding it because he's just rich now? Or I think either one. Is he a client? We might have to do two seasons because of a reboot. yeah, I think so. Because so Jimbo Fisher uses his buyout money to increase his stake in cattle farming. Perfect. And then you know some corporate raider comes in trying to buy him out of his cattle farms or maybe he's trying to poison his cattle <laughs> and Jimbo Fisher hires you know Pearson Specter lit to to take care of it I'm so in I'm so in oh done that I mean that would that would do ridiculous numbers like talking about reboot that you're all the way back at that point I don't know who like if is Netflix gonna make it an original whoever does it whatever production company we are available we'll write your scripts for you mm -hmm. <laughs> talk to you soon Thank you so much for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe to this channel right here so you never miss an episode of Andy Staples on 3. And oh, by the way,
watch all the other great videos on the On3Sports YouTube channel.